Welcome to Eclecticist. Eclecticist is an investigation of everything from a a British perspective by two brothers who consider themselves to be reasonably normal fellows. And we do this one topic at a time. We are Jeffrey Campos, myself, an engineer and devil's advocate, and my brother Benjamin de Campos, a designer and believer. We generally choose a topic of interest, or have one thrust upon us. We spend hardly any time at all researching it, and then we have a phlegm-filled discussion, and we publish the notes. The notes are available for you to read along with at eclecticist.co.uk, where you will also find a feedback form and information on all of our previous shows. We think that the main benefit of this is that it fosters a greater understanding of the world before we all die, and hopefully we prompt further thought and discussion from you, our listeners, and we learn a a thing or two along the way. The topic that we're mud wrestling with in this episode is social media. Please, for the love of all that's glorious in the world, look at these cat pictures. So says the global conversation according to that mass interactive communication platform, social media. One can scarcely bear to imagine what life might have been like before the brow-dampening joy of tweeting one's whereabouts to the indelible archive that is the internet. Validate me now, you sods. So says the unflinchingly self-aggrandizing mode of standing before the precipice of the infinite echo chamber. Possibly the perfect manifestation of aestheticism, we are as Dorian Gray, made monstrous bipolar narcissists forever shoveling coal into the furnace of negative feedback, built from an advertiser's wildest fantasy. You blocked me on Facebook, and now you're going to die. We're not going to be talking about wet dogs or bum bags, or fanny packs, whatever you want to call them. So... Social media, what is it? Well, according to dictionary.com, social media comprises of websites and other online means of communication that are used by large groups of people to share information and to develop social and professional contacts. So I think that's pretty loose and pretty vague because I think a lot of people, if they hear the term social media, they think of Facebook, but it's not just about chatting and gossiping and increasing your social standing. There's a lot of utility out there with services such as eBay and Yelp. So it's mass mass communication. It's a it's a publishing platform. It is. It is. But some of it's useful. Some of it isn't. Some of it's bewildering. Some of it's depressing. All of that kind of thing. But before social media, the social media in the digital age existed, what did we have? I suppose newspapers. I immediately assume newspapers would be what most people would think of as sort of a mass publication with uh, you know a long reach able to tickle the brains of peoples in far-flung parts of the world and it's fairly social or, or dictatorial in a, in a so- social kind of way but very that limited is a, a new yeah a newspaper is produced in the very early hours of the day or possibly even the hours uh, in the day previous, and it's you know d- distributed through physical means. You go and get the newspaper, you buy the newspaper, you have it delivered, and then you read the content of the newspaper, uh, opinion pieces, and you know just fact, hopefully fact based journalism. Uh, so uh, it's a many to one. It, it's sorry, it's a one to many sort of distribution mechanism. Whereas I think the power of social media is that it's many to many, really. You know, you have lots of broadcasters and lots of consumers. And you have the hybrid the hybrid of a consumer broadcaster. Not necessarily, though, because, I mean, in, in the last few weeks, there's been a news report about just one chump on Twitter who caused this world destabilizing god knows what do you remember some something he tweeted about trump yeah so um we have uh, newspapers obviously we have people who talk in person so if you wanted to engage more than one person um it's tricky 
you know, to, to, <laughs> to conduct your thoughts to more than one person at a time requires some kind of written language. It requires standing on a rock and, uh, you know, lecturing a group of people. Uh, or it, it, it means you must have some sort of, um, replication of your message so i can tell you something and then you repeat what i have said to other people and then hopefully that'll fan out to millions of people so getting ideas across is what communication is all about uh you want to try and tell people things and ideally you would want that to be a two-way conversation so i remember when i was a kid in school the ways in which we would try and get a message across to multiple people would be bulletin boards, literal bulletin boards, an actual cork bulletin board on the wall where you could post a message and many multiples of eyeballs would be able to see it. And if anybody's interested in whatever it was you had to say, then they can come and talk to you personally. And then we also had um, LAN messaging, so when I was a kid in school, in computer class, we were able to send text messages to each other on this rudimentary computer network. Uh, and that was, you know, right at the very beginning of any kind of computer messaging. So we had that. And there was a facility whereby you could send a message to the entire class. So again, one to many. So that was the very early seeds of social messaging, I think. And then we had email, of course, and the, the dawn of, of uh, the internet. We started to have sort of um, borderless communication systems like email, which unfortunately is still around. Um, IRC, instant, instant Relay Chat, I think it's called. I may be wrong there. I'll put it in the notes. But IRC is sort of like a chat room, and you can just create virtual rooms ad hoc uh, with names, and then other users of the IRC platform can then join those rooms, and you effectively have chat rooms. IRC is still around and still very popular, and I still think it's the best. ICQ, do you remember that one? Another very early chat uh, chat program uh, which worked over the internet. It's the first one that I used. Where you didn't have a username, you had a number. Everybody was a number back then. Oh, that's right. And then electronic bulletin boards, BBSs, you had AOL chat rooms, which were, you know, far ahead at the time when they were around. They were just uh, light years ahead of everything else, um, chat rooms and keywords. And, uh, and then you had, uh, of course, text messaging over mobile phone networks. So you were able to send text messages to pagers, and then you, later on you were able to send text messages to mobile phones from mobile phones. So the digital age, I think, happened quite quickly, even though it seems like, you know, literally 30 years ago. But really, the amount of time that has passed, given the massive leaps we've made into the future of telecommunications, is astonishing. Um, but I mean, I, I obviously remember before all of the big social media platforms, but they seem so monstrously large now. It's absolutely incredible. When... All of them first started, LinkedIn and Facebook and all of them. I bagged my name. As soon as they came out, I registered and just <laughs> got my own name and then just never used them. But as long as I have my own name, I thought that's important because I don't want somebody else pretending they're me or somebody somebody else thinking that they're me. Which platforms did you do that on? All of them, I think. <laughs> literally all of them when one comes out and i think okay this has some momentum i just sign up and because they're all free of course social message social media the the idea behind social media is advertising it's all about advertising all the revenue is advertising so we're in the early days of the, we're still in the early days of this sort of uh networked mass telecommunications system uh so the revenue is all driven by advertising. So the providers of these services hope that they are able to sell your eyeballs to advertisers. That's how it works. So you are the product. You benefit 
from their services. But in, in exchange, they're selling your data and they're selling your eyeballs to advertisers. Uh, and they're getting very good at this. And the algorithms are getting much more sophisticated. But do not delude yourself into thinking that the reason why you're not paying for these services is because you are participating in their advertising. So if we just talk about the social media as it is on the internet now, what what do people mean about Facebook? I mean, before we talk about the actual platforms, what effect is social media, the the sort of domain having on the social conversation in general? I mean, what is it and how is it contributing to society and what what is it contributing to society? I mean, it lives on the internet. It's a, it's a virtual thing. It mm. is completely um, internet based and people spend a lot of time using it and it has a very long reach. You know, it really can get to everyone on any pl- platform, any physical platform, any device you'll have all the social main major social media platforms present so it's used to communicate specifically that is to say you are able to specifically choose someone to have a conversation with over social media so that's virtually direct contact it's as if you're having a conversation with somebody you're just you're just doing it by other means and then there's another aspect of social media where you're not speaking to anybody in particular you're just speaking so you're speaking through a megaphone (laughs) and and you know you don't really know who you're speaking to or maybe you have an idea of who may be listening but they may not be listening so this harps back to IRC, where you would participate in a chat room, but you wouldn't be reading all of the messages that are flowing by. You're just working or doing something else. But somebody in the chat room can poke you and you'll get an alert on your computer and you go, ooh, somebody's poking me in that chat room. You'll unbury it um, on your windowed desktop and then, or, or your command line, if you're not using a GUI. And you would then look at the, the question or the statement from the person who pinged you. And then you have the whole context of the conversation there. So somebody could be saying, well, what do you think? And you can just scroll back and see the context of the chat room. And then you can chime in with your uh, tuppany bit. So I like that aspect, and I think that's what social media is. You can't assume everybody is watching or listening to what you're doing, um, but they can choose to come back to you on any particular topic. But I think the big difference between IRC and social media is that social media never goes away. It's there forever. Everything you post to the internet, you cannot be sure that it's not going to be there forever. So you kind of have to assume everything that you do on social media will be there forever. E- even Snapchat. I don't think that is the big difference. Just thinking about this, you know, sort of personally, I think there's I think there's something else. I think IRC, to, to use it generically, is problematic because you are anonymous, generally speaking. Whereas with Facebook, it's kind of... Facebook and maybe YouTube to a sort of lesser extent... It's kind of harder to be anonymous because Facebook, you're essentially, you've got all your information there to whatever degree. You know, it's, it's hard to be anonymous on Facebook if you're, if you're going to post or you're going to comment or anything like that. And so you can't be a troll keyboard warrior a-hole like you could back in the IRC days, don't you think? I agree. In IRC, you could get kicked out of the chat rooms effectively. So... You know, you have moderators, so, you know, you have to watch what you say, uh, else you're punished. So there's that sort of policing, but there's less accountability. So indeed, you can be completely anonymous um, in an IRC IRC chat room, uh, 
but you're you're accountable for your behavior in the melee, but you're not personally accountable like you can be on larger social media platforms of today, which I agree with, which I think is a good thing. You know, be, being accountable, personally accountable and publicly accountable for the things that you say mm. can be a good thing. It can be a very terribly bad thing as well. So, you know, I think it's riskier uh, to to contribute a lot to <laughs> social media platforms Um because you never you never know how what you can what you say can be taken out of context and you never know what kind of problem you can find yourself unable to get yourself out of mm. so you can say some fairly terrible things on social media and be punished and have no comeback <laughs> which is which is potentially a problem but it's a kind of it works both ways because if you're just being a terrible person in the things you're saying, you know, you get punished to whatever degree. But also the other side of that is, again, we spoke about this last week or the week before on our show about political correctness. Yeah, political correctness. It's that now suddenly we have people who won't want to lift their heads above the parapet for fear of being ostracized and vilified and uh, all of that kind of thing. I think that's true. Although I think the people who contribute the most on the social media platforms are probably a particular type of people who don't feel that way. I think the people who really don't want to say anything in case they say the wrong thing or offend anybody just simply don't use the platforms. So I think already we have a fairly narrow sample of the human population when it comes to these technologies. Well, speaking of a narrow sample of the human population, the Facebook and a lot of the others, um, the people who use those platforms are not, by any stretch of the imagination, a narrow sample. I mean, it's so ubiquitous, really. Everyone has a Facebook account, but there are a few notable exceptions, including you, Jeff. You don't have a Facebook account? I do. I ah. bagged my name. <laughs> oh, Facebook is one of the ones. All right, okay. <laughs> but I don't I don't use it, no. Actually, I don't I mean when it comes to social media, I have to say, I don't really use any of it. Right. I I mostly understand it, but a lot of it I'm 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 not understanding. And I had a conversation with a couple of nineteen year olds just the other day. On and they were IRC? Telling me, no, in real life. <laughs> in R L. And I was asking them about how they consume social media and how they use it. And they both said, they, they both confirmed my suspicion, which was they only use it on mobile phones. They ah. do not use any other means right. uh, to access these networks. And, uh, and they check in and they scroll through and then they check out and they do this often. Mm. And it's all on mobile phones. Mm. Well, it depends what they spend their days doing well, what do they do during the day what are their jobs they have jobs but they are they are using their social networks or, or consuming those social networks throughout the day in their jobs no but it's uh, if you are the kind of person that works at a computer then you'll almost certainly be using that computer for some of this absolutely not that ha absolutely is not the case according to the two 19 year olds i was speaking to no, but what do they do for a living are they are they shop assistants? They use they use computers all day, every day. Right. Okay. So they are sitting at their computers, but they are consuming social media on mobile phones. Right. They do not use their work computers at all for this social enterprise, although they could. They do not. They choose to use their mobile phones. So what insights do you get from that? Um I, I find it amazing that I mean I find it quite a chore to do much on mobile phones. I, I vastly prefer to view any sort of content on a larger screen. Right. And I think that's purely an age related thing. I think um, slowly I, I'm liking the tablet sort of format and my phone, my mobile phone, I can read on it. I mean, it's a big enough screen where I can comfortably read the news. And, and in fact, there are a few programs, a few sort of, um, news 
programs that are sort of like RSS. So they're RSS feed readers, effectively, on the mobile platform that I cannot get on the desktop platform. I, I literally don't have that facility on a desktop any longer. Uh, whereas on a mobile, these programs are made so well and they're so slick that they deliver all the information mm. I want in a, in a very nicely consumable package. So I think I understand why younger people are just completely glued to their mobiles at the expense of any other platform. Well, that's fine. But I think there's a couple of things there. I think you and I are from a generation where we're just, we haven't grown up with mobile phones really to, to some degree. But also, that's what it is. It's like I can read on my phone absolutely fine. And for like Facebook notifications and stuff and maybe occasional quick chats, I can certainly do on my phone and that's not a problem at all. But the the real problem is not having a freaking keyboard. <laughs> I just find typing on my phone with my thumb annoying and slow. And yes, I know you could speak your comments, but I find I'll say something like I posted something on Instagram, um, a car, a Lotus, and it was like, um, oh, here's a Lotus Elan. And then it thinks, I didn't say Elan, I said 11. So, so it's like, okay, I'll have to go back and manually edit that. And I keep on talking and there's 50 million other little typos and I then have to go and repair. And then it takes like three times longer than it would have done had I used my thumb, which takes 10 times longer than actually typing it on a keyboard. So there's just there's just that barrier that I can't seem to get past with using a phone for things that I would normally do on a computer. Indeed. I've seen, again, younger people typing on the virtual keyboards on iPhones like at 60 words per minute perfectly <laughs> they, they seem to be able to do it I absolutely cannot do it I'm, I've always favored the swipe method yes um, and I've used that from the, the very first swipe enabled virtual keyboards on Nokia's and I find I'm much more accurate and faster doing that than typing I went through a long period of Blackberries, so I had physical keyboards, which were absolutely slower, but just much more enjoyable to use. Mm. Uh, so yes, I think that's a massive barrier. I, I feel unproductive on any mobile computer because mm. I just need a full keyboard. Yeah, With a full keyboard, I'm at home, even though I probably make more typing mistakes on a physical keyboard. With a, for, with a full keyboard, you literally are at home. Literally. Okay, should we go through this list? I don't normally like going through lists, but I think in this instance it might be the most useful way to uh, discuss this. Okay, so these are current social media platforms. So I think number one, and I think potentially this is the 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 number one most used social platform. I don't I don't have the stats here actually, but I, I'm fairly certain that Facebook it has the most active users. Mm of any platform, including Twitter. I should say that this list is actually, I can't remember where I got this not from. Not exhaustive. <laughs> no, it's not exhaustive, but it is like the top 10 of the most used social media platforms. And the source, which unfortunately, and I'm ashamed to say I can't recall, but you can Google this and it comes up on some reputable website. And that's what this is. So Facebook has been around for quite a long time. Over, is it 10 years? Over 10 years now. Uh, well, I started a f Facebook profile in 2007. And I think that's when it, it exploded. But it had been around for a while. And I think it was called the Facebook or something. And it was a lot of universities started, uh, had Facebook way before it, it, it became sort of like in the public domain um, in like 2004, maybe. But it's certainly been around longer than most of these. Yeah, Mark Zuckerberg, he is the the founder and the initial programmer of the system. And I think it, it, it was intended as a way in which you could organize meetups at universities. I, I think it, it was like a, a college messaging system or something. I don't know that much about it, but I think that's true. And it catapulted him into mega fame and it was phenomenally popular and i very early on i just didn't understand why it was so popular but yeah but somebody i i asked a friend of mine i said look you know sell sell me facebook and she said it's really useful for organizing get-togethers because you can see other people's calendars and you can work out when everybody's available 
And I thought, okay, well, I can see the utility in that. That seems like a good idea. Um, and, and that was it. <laughs> okay, well, okay. I think it would be interesting if we just put our own personal take into each of these. Because Facebook, I don't spend a great deal of time on there. I find it annoying because it's a good platform for just natural show-offs and all the smug people that you know and you wish you didn't who keep telling you how amazing their life is, whether it be through, you know, posts about what they've got gotten up to, you know, ostensibly about, you know, something stupid, but they're actually just showing off about how amazing they are. But it's useful for just staying abreast of what's happening, you know, in, in your circles. Staying abreast of all the fake news. Well, well, there's that, but I just mean in, in a personal sense, you know, people you know who you, you actually like, um, they are keeping you informed of what's happening in their life. If you happen to be the, me, the meal that they had last night. Yeah, you can get you as true. You want to know that. One of the things that I actually go to Facebook for occasionally is what's trending. So with the stories that are trending on Facebook, which is always kind of interesting. And it's quite smart as well, because, for example, it'll trend some sports news and then i can say look i'm not interested in that and then it learns not to give me any sport updates and then so gradually it becomes quite a well-tuned conduit of of current events but you can see how if people are choosing the more and more frivolous things that are going on in the world how it could just be this echo chamber of just stuff that just doesn't matter in, in the grander scheme of things. Like you, you can be as interested in the outside world as you want or as disinterested and only hear about celebrities and all that kind of thing. So there is use in that. Also, what's particularly depressing is it shows you the numbers of people who are circulating certain stories. And when it's something like, you know, Kanye West or... Uh, what's Having the, a breakdown. What's the Jenner fellow? Or not fellow, lady... What's his first name? Uh, the transgender. Yeah, is it Kyle? He used to be an something? athlete, and and now he's. <laughs> yeah, but um, apparently he's now going back to being a dude or something. I don't know. But it's like every time you get like a very consequential news item about the destruction of the world, it's like four hundred people are uh, discussing this. And then you get something about this Jenner fellow, and it's like four million people are discussing this. So that's all kind of interesting. But the people who are, I mean, I, we are talking about a, a sample of the human population. I mean, these are a particular group of people. Yes. Um, the, the, you mentioned how you are able to filter your news. So you get into this sort of search bubble phenomenon that we've spoken about before. Um, Last FM, the, the music service, the streaming music service, you could scrobble. That's what. That's the verb they used to select only the music that you want, uh, and then you're only delivered the music that you like, and then you are unable to ever discover anything new outside of your scrobble bubble. Uh, similarly, Facebook. If you just it's 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 an opt out, which I suppose is better. But you are given an article or a type of articles, a genre, and you can say. No, I don't, I'm not interested, not interested in that. Uh, thanks, but no. And then slowly you narrow your, uh, your view of the, the world of news. Uh, so that's a potential problem, especially if Facebook is the only place you go to get news. And I think this has been in the news recently because there are fake news stories circulating on Facebook and that people fall for. They, they, I mean, maybe they're gullible people, but potentially they are people who do not get their news from any other sources. So when they are exposed to fake news stories on Facebook, that sways their thinking and possibly sways the way they vote, which is has been alleged in the United States over the general election. Mm. So I think that's a problem. You have the scrobble effect of the algorithms that Facebook runs. And also this problem with fake news. And I, I read a story where there used to be editors, news editors at Facebook, but it was thought that they were biased or that they could become biased. So they basically got rid of them all and replaced them with algorithms. 
<laughs> to get to eliminate the problem of bias. Mm. Uh, so I think Mark Zuckerberg and all of his friends at Facebook don't want all of his goons to, to deliver fake news or appear to be partisan in some way. But I think it's inevitable given the platform that it's going to happen. And also with regards to news, I mean, Facebook, um, correct me if I'm wrong here, but Facebook is a network of people. These are active users who have accounts who say things and they say things publicly on Facebook or they can say things privately on Facebook. But effectively, it's the consumers, the product, the eyeballs who are creating all the content. So I don't quite understand how Facebook could be accountable for the general trends on the platform, given it's the livestock who create the content. Mm. I don't quite understand, but I, I think they're, they're, the media at large is suggesting that Mark Zuckerberg should take on more responsibility for what is said on Facebook. And I think that's kind of odd. So is he going to start censoring things? I don't know. Do people get kicked off of Facebook? I don't oh, know. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Facebook has got pretty rigid guidelines and parameters for what you can and cannot say or post, like images and uh, hate speech. Oh, yeah, there was a story whereby whereby someone was suspended or content was censored because it was breastfeeding or yes. or it was breast cancer awareness or something like that. But the, the, the image algorithms just kicked in and saw nipples and went, wait a minute, inappropriate, get rid. But, I mean, there's all sorts of problems with that, as has been in the news, because you get stuff like that, which is taken down. But then you don't have images of decapitated bodies or you know it's just isis based propaganda that isn't taken down apparently with any reliability i'm that might be more twitter i'm not sure but it's that's a thing so i mean i'm i don't use facebook so you'll have to explain to me if i were interested in astronomy on facebook how do i get astronomical articles in my it's a chronological timeline isn't it how do i get astronomy articles in my feed is there are there like hashtags now like twitter this is something again so this is like the blind leading the blind because this is not what i do on facebook but every organization associated with um uh as, would you say astrology astronomy <laughs> which it's is like, the same thing it's like every organization will typically have pressure be under pressure to have a social media presence. So they will likely have a Facebook page that someone in their organization maintains. And then so you can go and follow that page and then you will be, you, you will get updates in your Facebook feed from them if you elect to receive them. But what if I don't, I don't know about them? I'm interested in astronomy, but I have no idea about any of the businesses or... You know, I, I don't know anything. All I know about is stars and planets and things. Well, here's what might happen. It's quite possible that this is what happens on Facebook. In your About You section, you can describe the things you're interested in. And then the various bots will scan that and then will send you little suggestions about which, who to follow in your feed. So, for example, I when I first set up Facebook, I jokingly said I'm interested in welding and uh, pole dancing. And for a while, I kept getting welding and pole dancing um, suggestions in my feed. Okay, so you 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 okay? That that makes sense. It's like Flipboard, which is another RSS style news aggregator, uh, which I don't like. Right. And when you first set it up, you just go through these topic clouds, page after page after page of them, to try and pick out everything that you're interested in, in the world, mm. and then hopefully it'll then you know, give you a, a chronological feed of everything and then you can specify each individual topic for the most recent news, which right. is, I think is the same as that's how all of them work. I think mm. logically that makes total sense. Um, so well, well, but before we move on from Facebook, another little Facebook irritant, and it's a similar with LinkedIn, which we'll get on to, but that's slightly different, is a kind of social currency, which is the numbers of friends you have. Oh, yes, of course. Which is annoying. Your friendsters. Yeah, which is annoying. And this is what I mean about, I'm, I made a comment earlier. I, mean, I don't link to anybody with less than a thousand friendsters. <laughs> friendsters. 
Friendster. Yeah, Friendster. That's an interesting one. Um, I was never on Friendster. But the, uh, with Facebook, there were almost certainly people who have a ton of friends who they're not really friends with. I mean, how can you have like 10,000 friends? <laughs> and uh, But y- you can switch off whether or not you get updates from them. So there's this political aspect of who are your friends. So it's like, I can't not be friends with this person but I hate this person and I'm going to turn off all updates from them. But for political reasons, you know, I need to uh, be appearing outwardly as though I'm friendly with this person. So there's a lot of that. Surely you can be rumbled on that. Oh, for sure. But there's a lot of, oh my God, we're at school (laughs) about that kind of phenomena in the Facebook arena. I mean, it's amazing. I don't feel as though I've ever seriously offended anybody in my life or made any lifetime enemies. Right. But even so, I really don't want to be exposed <laughs> to the point where I can receive communications from people I'd really rather not receive communications from. Oh, that sounds paranoid. I guess I, I do like anonymity. I, I, you you preface that saying, oh, I've not offended anyone, but then you say yeah, something I don't, like I don't that. Think, I don't think I would have anything to fear, <laughs> is what I'm saying. Right. But even so, I wouldn't like to hear from anybody. Okay. Well, I'm glad I dodged uh, that all. bullet. Your listeners should realize that Jeff is just becoming his father. Yeah. But, I mean, I just, I, I don't see what there is to gain. Right. But we will move on to LinkedIn. No, we got uh, YouTube moving on, next. Yeah, moving on from Facebook, YouTube. So YouTube, uh, I do know about YouTube, and it is truly amazing. Uh, this is, and we've 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 done a whole show on YouTube, but it is a platform to which you can upload video content for free, and then have it viewed by. Any number of hundreds of millions of people, depending on its popularity and advertising. But it is a free asterisk service uh, that you can consume and enjoy and create content for. And it is vast. It is huge. It is so big that really there isn't anything else that even comes remotely close. If you're, if you're, Interest is to broadcast your message to as many people as possible. That is the de facto standard platform. And I enjoy it. I really find it very interesting. I think it's the perfect blend of search results and video content. It's just incredible. You know, if ever I'm going to buy a product, I don't bother reading long form articles anymore. I just search on YouTube. And I think YouTube YouTube is YouTube is like the second biggest search engine in the world. It's it's right there after Google. So Google search and then YouTube search. <laughs> Those are the two biggest search engines. Yeah, you, you can you can listen to some guy give his own review about what you just bought or what you're thinking of buying. Yes, when I took this out of the package, I noticed that it didn't have the special tabs that come. <laughs> There's yeah, and they sound exactly like that. But it's it's you know it's a, you know a picture paints a thousand words. Yes, it's it's so much more informative to see the product mm. being handled and used versus a, a long form right. you know review article. So I think all websites lose out to YouTube, and most websites these days will have an embedded YouTube video in them anyway, especially if it's a product review. Uh, so I think it 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 is absolutely incredible and it's just getting better and better all the time it runs better it has high resolutions it has 3d and you know 360 degree videos now and it is unstoppable and i think that worries me a little bit i mean i have never ever read any of the comments in on youtube videos i just don't even see them (laughs) i watch the video that's it i don't know anything about what's underneath the video that's no not interested. I gather that's quite a big social media aspect to YouTube, but I, I think it's mostly just the subs- subscribers, you know, how many people subscribe to watch your content. Uh, so again, it's a numbers game. Why are you saying in such certain terms that, no, I'm not interested, don't care? 
No, I, I'm personally not interested in the comments underneath the videos, but I know they are important. Um, I, and I know this because a lot of the content creators to whom I'm subscribed mention the fact. Uh, they will say, I have had comments on my YouTube video about X, Y, and Z, uh, so let's address that now. So they, if you create content, you're interested in the comments under your video. But is anybody else? I'm not sure. I simply don't know because I don't read them. The big elephant in the room with talking about YouTube comments is how it's the place where the worst people in the world tend to hang out. It's like if you ever find yourself reading YouTube comments, which you apparently haven't, you know that you need to die. Yes. Um, YouTube, like Facebook, is a private enterprise. It's a single private company that hosts all the content and all the comments and pays the money and does all the advertising, everything. It's one company, just like Facebook. So that's a little bit worrying because Facebook, there are alternatives to Facebook. I don't think there really are any alternatives to YouTube. That's not true. Which is a bit worrying. Yeah. Well, there are a couple, but they are so minuscule in comparison. Vimeo, I mean, you know, it's it's... It's scales of magnitude away from YouTube. But even so, Vimeo is also a private company. So there is another private company called Library, with all the vowels taken out. Library.io. And this company has created a new protocol. So like HTTP, it has created LBRY. And the idea is that it would be a decentralized video hosting platform. So it would look like YouTube, but in fact, it would be more like uh, BitTorrent. So it would be ultra distributed. Not only the files would be distributed, but also the way it's monetized would be distributed. It sounds quite interesting. I think perhaps you would have to convince the browser manufacturers to support the protocols. That's a bit of a problem. But you can download their plugin and then participate in the world of decentralized video. Mm. And I think maybe that's the way to go. I like the idea of decentralization in the face of monopoly, which I think YouTube is becoming. Um, so I think there's social media, and then there are individual companies who benefit from social media because you know you have a whole bunch of volunteers who are contributing to a vast database that you extract value from so i think you know these free services are all fab fabulous but you have to remember <laughs> that the benefit of hosting them is that we have big data and uh you know information mining uh whether that's a good thing i don't know we're up in the air about that. But YouTube, I think, is an amazing social media platform. It's video. It's broadcasting. It has incredible reach. And it's, it's, it's compelling. You know, video is compelling. And it makes every possible effort to make it easier for you to uh, contribute. So I think ultimately it's a good thing. I certainly enjoy it. Twitter? Yeah, Twitter, I... Just t Twitter, I don't know. I I kind of am very changeable with Twitter. Sometimes I think it's interesting. Sometimes I hate it. My main problem with Twitter at the moment is just the, the strange threading of responses to tweets. So I go to Twitter because I'm interested to know what the few people I follow have to say. And it's like right at the top, there'll be some comment, no, no, some response to someone. And you have to like try and drill down to find out where this, what they're responding to. And you have other people responding to this response that then creates confusion. Um, and then by that point, I've gotten bored and I'm not, and I do something else. Occasionally, it's interesting to hear about stuff, you know, straight from the horse's mouth, because quite often people who you might be a fan of and follow, they will actually be tweeting themselves and you can find out what they think you know, before they publish their opinions in, you know, in, in more established um, areas. But so that's my main annoyance. And plus also, it kind of 
No, that's all I have to say about it. What do you think about Twitter? You, you actually were into Twitter before I was. I remember, because in the early days, and you might not remember this, but you were quite pro-Twitter, telling me how great it is. I'm still pro-Twitter. I, I just don't use it. I mean, originally, it was a micro-blogging platform. So it's a blog in a text message. Um, and that's what it was. But then it innovated a new feature, which was the hashtag. So that was a way in which you could comment on a topic. And I think that's where everything really exploded. And I think that's the real power of Twitter. I like the idea that it's live, it's instantaneous, it's simple, accessible. Uh, you can tweet as you're running away from the bullets from your own government, you know, potentially. Uh, so you can follow topics live by following the hashtags. And, uh, you know, it gives you a real live news experience. And, uh, you know, that has value. There are new Twitter applications where you can watch sporting events, for instance. So you're watching video of a sporting event in at one side of your screen. And on the other side of the screen, you have a live feed of tweets um, by a filterable number of people. So, you know, you could you could specify who you want commenting mm. on the live video that you're seeing. So basically, you can design your own commentary on video. And I think that's pretty interesting. That's interesting. Because you're talking about comments and video, but you're not interested in comments on video with YouTube. No, it's different. Twitter is different because it's live. So while I'm watching a football game... I can see live tweets right. besides it. Did you just see that? That was a total foul. I can't believe the ref didn't see that. The ref is completely blind. The ref should be murdered. Right. Live as it's happening. So you're watching the video and then you look over and you see what people are saying. And you can say, wow, yeah, that's what I think too. Mm. Yeah, outrageous. Yeah. And so that that's really cool. It gives another dimension to enjoying live events um, because you have live opinions from any number of people. And again, you can... You can um, hone the types of viewpoints or the, the people uh, that you like to the video that you're watching. So I think that's hugely powerful. But certainly it, is, it, gives, it gives you an idea of what people are thinking and, you know, and even in real time, um, which is, is really great. YouTube has done this for a while uh, to a smaller extent um, where it has live broadcasts and, uh, you know, as there's the live broadcast you also have a sort of like a chat room basically so it's sort of similar um but twitter i think is just so immensely powerful it blows my mind that they just can't seem to monetize it <laughs> they just don't know how to make money out of it and people see it as a service you know a, a public utility uh so it's so incredibly popular and so well used and yet it's extremely hard to extract money from and I think maybe that's because it's restricted to the 160 characters or whatever it is. Although I think maybe they've relaxed that now. Now that is no longer the case or is soon to no longer be the case. Right. Uh, but I think the power is that everybody has an incredibly short attention span. And I'd rather read what 16 people are saying about something rather than just spend 10 minutes reading what one person thinks about something. You know, we, we constantly want to try and average things out and uh, take a consensus view and twitter is great for that because it's so um, concise mm. so i think it's it's fabulously powerful and it, it wouldn't surprise me at all if a company like microsoft or salesforce uh or another you know messaging company were to buy it and incorporate it, it wouldn't surprise me if apple bought twitter i wouldn't be too surprised if that were to happen well the big stink about twitter currently is how it's being policed um, and how people are being permanently banned and um, the double standard with uh, certain speech that's being completely suppressed and what's allowed to uh, pass through the, um, the various members of the morality police, which you mentioned in the, uh, in the description. It is odd, yes. People are permanently banned for the things that they say and those people who are banned um, you know, point at the double standards in a lot of cases. And the most recent one I read about was someone was banned for 
saying something that could be construed as anti-feminist. And the comment was made in a Twitter conversation where there was a Muslim cleric involved. And the Muslim cleric was saying effectively the same thing, but he was spared because it's part of his culture so claimed to be anti-feminist. <laughs> Whereas the non-Muslim, self-identifying non-Muslim, uh, was permanently banned for saying effectively the same thing. So, mm. you know, it's tricky. If you want morality police, then, you know, with a, with a, with a, with a platform that has a global reach a, across all countries and cultures, then surely it's impossible to be non-partisan and to maintain any kind of consistency. It's just crazy. So you have a large audience who think censorship of any kind whatsoever on any of the social, social media platforms is a mistake. But then other people who think rightly that, you know, there's certain types of content that quite frankly, you really don't want broadcast on such an amenable technology. So it's a funny one. Uh, you know, I don't really want to tune into my news feed and see horrific images that are going to traumatize me for days, particularly. Um, but at the same time, I don't want to tune into a channel that doesn't really tell me anything because it's so scared that it might offend somebody. And there are so many people to offend when you include all cultures. Uh, so Twitter is in a tricky position with morality and, and just general ethics. But as a technology, I still think it's pretty amazing, even though I don't fully understand how to use it. Many times I've gone to the internet to try and follow a hashtag, and I just simply don't know how. It doesn't seem easy to me how you'd want to do that. Why is there not a website you can go to and you can just type in what you imagine a hashtag might be, and it'll chuck out what, what's available that's similar, similar to IRC channels. Um, and then just follow those and build your own sort of chronological feed. But I just, for the life of me, can't figure it out. I'm sure it can be done, but I just don't know how it works. Um, LinkedIn. Mm. I think this is a Microsoft platform. LinkedIn has been purchased by Microsoft. I'm fairly certain it has. Has been. Again, it's been around for ages and ages and ages. And I think the idea behind it is that it's just pure cold business networking that's it it's networking uh, i get god knows how many linkedin requests a day and you know it's just I, I spoke to you for 20 minutes yesterday on the phone about something and now you're sending me a linkedin request what i don't know who you are um definitely gotta be a numbers game i just just seems evil to me am i wrong the thing i like about linkedin amongst lots of things I don't like about it, is it's the fact that it's kind of making putting a curriculum vitae, or as we say here in the United States, a resume, uh, putting that together kind of redundant. You just don't need it. It's now you can, you can just look at your LinkedIn profile, you know, and it's as long as you want it to be. You don't have to like craft this page long description of yourself and have to worry about type well you still have to worry about typos but you have to worry about the design and what to include and what not to include linkedin is just has it all there and i think that's good well i don't i don't see the utility there because you want to you want to specify your resume or resume as they call it over here um for specifically for the sector you're targeting if you're somebody who isn't that narrow. If you're a little bit more general, then you'll have several CVs that are, that are that are designed for slightly different areas of expertise. Okay. All right. Well, fair enough. But I, I don't. I think that's kind of weird. You know, you choose an area you're interested in. Why would you want to employ someone who's just can't seem to figure out what it is that they want to do? Well, no, because they have multiple skills that are applicable in different yeah, sectors. Sounds jack of all trades like to me. Yeah, but if <laughs> if you genuinely have more than one skill, then surely you're going to want to you're going to want to highlight 
the particular skill that you're looking to be employed for at, at any one time. Yeah, but why does that make LinkedIn not suitable for that? Well, because when you when you visit somebody's LinkedIn page, then you'll think you'll pigeonhole them as what they're advertising themselves to be. Whereas in fact, you're not pigeonholeable because you have two legitimate skills. So when you're looking for a job, you will take a job for either of those skills, right? If it's the right offer. So you don't want to say I'm this but not that. You want to say I'm this and that. I don't understand. So what's an example of of what what someone's career history is? I'm not talking that about would... career history. Career right. history is career history. You can't change that. So what are you I'm talking t- about? You said why have a CV when you can just put it in LinkedIn? But if you you can't put two CVs in LinkedIn. What, yeah, but what what would both CVs be? I don't get it. They would it's be CVs CV of, of what different you've done. skills. No, 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 no. They're different, right? A CV isn't just a job history. A CV is your own description of your most salient skills that are pertinent to the job that you're applying to. So, you know, I, I believe I would be of value to your company because... Tumpty, tumpty, tumpty. I see. I don't think that's actually correct. I think you have a cover letter which will explain more specifically your fit with whatever job you're applying for, and the CV is a a lot has a a much briefer part, and then the rest of it is a description of all the places that you've worked, and then a list of your skills. You want to float the pertinent skills to the top. Basically, you can filter out the non-relevant skills and just keep the relevant skills in. I'm not convinced by your your counter argument, but we'll have to disagree on that. Um, anything else on LinkedIn? Uh, do you have a LinkedIn account? Yeah, I bagged it when they first started. <laughs> I have I have an account on every, everything. I've not actually seen its use, particularly when looking at colleagues' profiles, uh, and yeah, I. <sighs> I, I get it, but you know, it, it seems to me that you're pretending to know people or pretending other people are more valuable than they are. And it's the same as Facebook. I think, you know, all of your professional contacts. Yeah, exactly what kind of professional contacts are the 3,000 people who are linked to your account? No, because, like, for example, I mean, I have gotten work from looking up a company that i am interested in working for finding the key movers and shakers and then contacting them directly yeah yeah i mean that, well that's that's the telephone directory aspect of it yeah i don't see a problem there and that makes total sense um but much beyond that i think pretending people are your friends who aren't i think is problematic right that's not about that, friends, that's all, though. That's all I'm saying. That's not friends. I mean, the tenuous link is someone you might have done business with, someone you may have worked with. Yeah. Uh, there's a whole list of things. Before you, when you try and reach out to someone, it gives you, like, how do you know this person? <laughs> and I think one of the checks boxes is, I don't know this person. And then if you check on that, and then there's a barrier. It's like, apparently, you can't move forward after that. Oh, I won't check that then. Yeah. Anyway. Um, Pinterest. Mm. I mostly don't know anything about this at all. Right. Pinterest is great because what that is done in my line of work, and my line of work as being a designer, is completely reduce the need to have physical books. It's like there used to be great big books that are printed to a very great expense and cost a lot of money to buy that are like source resources. It's like they're like an anthology of you know, winners of a certain design award for whatever year. And then so you can look through and then, you know, get inspiration for any job that you might be working on currently and stuff like that. And so these big stupid books would take up all this room in your living quarters and you just don't need that anymore. Now you've got Pinterest, which has all the same content that you can actually search. It's like, oh, I want to search for, so I mean, you know, this particular style of job that I'm interested in. Job as in this project, this design project. And, you know, suddenly you get a whole plethora of things to pick and choose from. You can bookmark, you can just What's do all What's the difference between that and just a Google search? Well, Google search, you get all the crap that has nothing to do with what you're talking about, like stuff that's nothing to do with anything in the design world, whereas Pinterest is far more about that. So is Pinterest for designers? Uh, It's for a lot of people. It's for 
Well, I don't know what it's. I mean, I don't know what it is. I honestly, I don't know what it is. I don't have a Pinterest account. I have to admit. Okay, so well, imagine Google Images. But I mean, instead- Pinterest, the name. I'm thinking it's your own personal bulletin board. Okay. Well, imagine Google. Yes, it's like that. But imagine uh, Google Im- Google Images that you do a search, and your returns are not someone wearing a Union Jack thong. You, you mean a, a a Union flag thong? So. How does copyright work? I mean, how do you pin things on your board that, I mean, how do you know you're not going to get sued for copyright infringement? I don't know. It's a very gray area. It's probably pretty hard to sue just some chump. If I upload a photograph of uh, a monk painting, right. um, surely somebody's going to take issue with that and say, hang on a minute, you know, you're not monk. No, I think w- when were monk paintings painted? <laughs> a long time ago. Yeah, it's probably out of copyright anyway. Yeah, okay, well, bad, bad example. But I mean, any anything. Like, I take a photograph of uh, a bus that has a huge Nike swoosh on the side of it. Can right. I just pin that? Or are they going to say, hang on a minute? I don't know. It depends what it would be. I mean, I don't. there's probably crazy um, copyright bots that do, like, an algorithmic search and will crack down if it's maybe something disparaging, but... I don't know. I, it must be a pretty gray area. It sounds completely unenforceable to have laws that you can't post a picture of a Nike swoosh on your board. I mean, I understand why the TV production companies will have a problem with YouTube putting their content on there, but I don't know how you would do it with things like LinkedIn. I mean, uh, you Pinterest. were saying that big coffee table books, uh, you don't need to buy them anymore because what? The content is on Pinterest or the books themselves have been scanned and uploaded to Pinterest? What, what do you mean? Maybe. It might, there might be some of that, perhaps. But I don't think so. I think also the difference is, is rather than have, you know, a designer or some creative person who created something have to try and get their work into one of these big stupid books, that's gone. Now you have the actual people who could just upload their stuff. And if you're interested in it, then you could follow and then you know, get updates from this particular person that you're interested in. And it's things like Pinterest that, you know, a graphic artist or a typographer or a photographer or whatever will have their account. And so then it cuts out a lot of the middlemen. And again, this is part of the social media revolution. So this is personal publishing. Yeah. And and all of that. So, but I don't know what the deal is with copyright. It's, I imagine they haven't figured that one out yet. Google plus. Now, this is on the list of top 10, not by choice. I think it's just Google have managed to sort of elbow its way into our lives in such a way that it's just there whether we like it or not. And as far as I know, Google+, Plus, which the idea was it was meant to be like a rival to Facebook, really hasn't become that and no one's interested. But because everyone has a Gmail account, they have a Google+, Plus account by default. Yeah, they've tried many times to crack the social media nut. Yes. And they've all been failures. Um, lots of times. It's amazing. They just can't seem to to do it. You know, why was Facebook so popular? How come it squeezed through? I don't fully understand. Uh, Google, I mean, they have just everything there. Um, but they just can't do it. Tumblr. Yeah, they failed Tumblr, so much. Tumblr, Tumblr, I don't know I what it is. I just don't understand. It? Don't, don't Tumblr. It's a blog. It's a, it's like a blogger. It's a blog with yeah. pictures. Picture blogging. There you go. Tumblr and Instagram, when they first arrived on the scene, you know, whenever that would have been, 2000, I can't remember. When I first noticed them was probably 2008, 2009. I remember saying, these won't last. They're too crap. And I was wrong. Tumblr is more popular than ever for some reason. And um, Instagram the same. We might as well just talk about these two things together. Yeah, but bo- bo- both of those I I don't use, and I don't know how to use. <laughs> I don't know how to use Tumblr. Is it a website I can visit? Tumblr is. Can I search it? F- from what what I know about Tumblr is, people who have a Tumblr account have a page that they can put whatever they want on there, and so it's been very attractive to people who are interested in their own hate speech. Because I think the rules for Tumblr for taking stuff down aren't quite as tight as Facebook or YouTube even. So it's a good platform for, for that. So, I mean, uh, what, I, what I fantasize about Tumblr and what it might be 
is that it's like Blogger, just just a bunch of blogs, but they're tied together in some way. Like there's a front page that you can visit that shows you what's trending and the newest editions and that sort of thing. Is is that what it's like, or is it just individual blogs that God knows how you would discover? Uh, I don't know. I remember what put me off of Tumblr was just how hard it was to search for stuff. And the amount of chaff you'd have to wade through of crap you have no interest in. And who knows, it might have changed. I haven't really explored it. But I know it's still popular because people talk about it a lot. In fact, you mentioned feminism earlier. And there's this third wave of feminism, the one that has a lot of people, the the most polarizing. um, Feminazis? Yeah, what's the word I'm groping for? Like the most polarizing Don't say no it's like it's like the mark as in like mark one two and three the most polarizing what <laughs> i know what you okay. mean <laughs> that um it's now there there some people call them tumblr feminists and it's like wow tumblr yeah. uh instagram is a little bit more refined and i hated it when it started so basically just to summarize what instagram is i think instagram is only available on mobile devices and you essentially take a photograph of your coffee <laughs> as people generally do and it's a square yeah it doesn't actually no no a it doesn't have to photograph. change that now so now it could be a, it right. could be a rectangle so typically people take photographs of their coffees or if they're flying on holiday they take a photograph of the wing of the plane through the window or they're on holiday they take a photograph of their feet on a sun lounger what's what's the other one you generally see uh, the, any sort of mountain range. They, they take photographs of themselves and um i was driving somewhere and there was this group of these young trendy looking kids like fashion students or something men and this guy was making this face he was kind of like pursing his lips and stuff and i was wondering what the hell is he doing and then i saw that he's trying to take a photograph of himself you know looking super cool with something in the background so that is instagram and um i hated it when it started because i had an instagram account and i'd post you know pictures that i found funny like i'd see a typo or a funny sign i'd post it to, to who to who are you posting it to well, just just i'd have like a couple of friends in my in my sort of instagram circle so other right, people so you're entertaining them yeah yeah i'd say hey look at this right. isn't this funny and i would want them to like it they could have a little ah. heart button that they press and i want them to oh, like right, it because by liking it they like me Right. Um, and lots of people would like my stuff. And I noticed that they weren't really people. They were like these sort of spam bots or there were... Like bots. Yeah, like <laughs> bots. But they were typically, you know, a photograph of a sexy woman saying, oh, follow me for more sexy pics. You know, all this kind of stuff. And that seems to be all Instagram was. And so I kind of stopped using it for years. And now I just opened it up again. And it seems that they've much improved it and gotten rid of all of the s- spam bots. And just as a little aside and a digression, I think spam bots might be what killed ICQ. Do you remember when we were using it? There was mm. always like sexy non-humans who pretended to be humans trying to then chat to you. <laughs> Lurking in the background. <laughs> but that's what Instagram was. But now it's not like that anymore. So now I, I have a, a car, like a, a car account where I post every day a picture of a classic car and I meet a lot of like-minded other classic car people who like it. And we share comments and we say, ooh, I like your car. Interesting. Uh, Reddit. So Reddit is huge. They're sort of like the engine of the internet. <laughs> kind of, but they're, they're sort of, um, they're like private eye in that they're actually making a statement with how freaking ugly the UX is. Like private eye, I think is such a horrible little magazine, but it's like. You're, you're talking about the desktop web page. For what? Reddit. Yes. Because Reddit, Reddit, Reddit is a database. There are millions yeah. of different types of ways you can access it. There are millions of different GUIs. But it's, the, but it's so old looking. It looks like what the internet looked like in the 90s. Just with the, the style. Um, this is a desktop website you're talking about. Okay. Well, I've never used the one on the phone, so maybe um, I need to. So I can yeah, there, there are lots of, lots of ways to access it. Lots of different ways right. to access Reddit. Um, I... Yeah, I, I I've never been to the Reddit website. I've I've been to to the web the Reddit website, but I have not actually used it. Yes, it looks ferociously ugly, um, but it's mostly just text, I think. Uh, and they have subreddits, so called, mm. and this is where the social media aspect of the platform lurks. Right. So you have subreddits, and the participants in the subreddits which are just um, folders, 
they are they, they have a voting system, I believe, mm-hmm. and you're voted to the top, which simply means that when you arrive at the subreddit, you're more likely to see what's at the top than at the bottom. Right. Just by the physics of the internet. Um, and it doesn't, it's moderated and it's quite infamous for its moderators. Uh, and they have subreddits on every possible topic you can imagine. So it's sort of like a, a real time conversation about everything. So I quite like the concept there and you're able to have conversations with other participants in the subreddits. Um, most famously, this is the AMA, Ask Me Anything. So people who are experts in their field or famous will uh, descend to Reddit. And uh, for a limited time, uh, they will ask the Reddit community f- to ask them questions, anything at all. And the most popular questions, as voted, uh, will rise to the top and are more likely to be answered by the expert slash celebrity. So I think that's quite an interesting forum-style social media platform. I think that's deeply flawed, though, as we've discussed before, because there comes a point where anyone posting a question just disappears because all the, and people only see the questions at the top. So they only yeah, vote up the ones that they see. Yeah, I don't quite understand how the voting is... Mm. fair <laughs> uh, snapchat this is mind-blowingly popular with young people oh man and i think the idea is that this is messaging that has um a timer right. so not necessarily notionally everything that you say on snapchat will disappear in 24 hours or something and, yeah it's uh, it, it's it, it, they've kind of expanded that it's now not necessarily just that but have you ever tried to use snapchat no Okay. But I've seen it being used, and I like the filters and yeah, the, the filters funny are awesome. computer graphics. But in, in a previous job, I worked with essentially children. By children, I mean... 20-somethings. <laughs> who are like children. And um, you know, these are people in their mid to late 20s, but they were just all over Snapchat. And I felt a certain pressure to put it on my phone and had to get someone explained to me as if I'm like a 70-year-old getting a 10-year-old to explain something to me on the phone. But I just threw my arms up. The interface for Snapchat is so appallingly bad. It's so unintuitive. It just beggars belief. You need to have a go on it just so you could just delete it in frustration. It's just infuriating. But it's phenomenally popular for reasons which just aren't clear to me. And it's used, it's, it's used for taking smutty photographs that you hope... Uh, will disappear. <laughs> no, people don't take a screen grab. Of it. <laughs> yeah, very odd. I mean, what's that about? Yeah, but I don't so know anyway. if that's even true anymore. I think they might have um, just gone beyond that now. And it's just like, um, I don't know. It's just kind of like Facebook-like because you do have companies that have a presence on Snapchat and they pay so much money for that. It's mm. really, really, really expensive to have space on Snapchat. That's how popular right. Snapchat is. Mm. Yeah, I mean, you have you have uh, elevated users or special users. Like Twitter has its um, confirmed users. They get, they get a little a blue ribbon on their profile page or something. Uh, and you can have that stripped, and it's humiliating when that happens. Um, similarly, you have followers in Snapchat. So again, you can have fake follow- followers, and you can buy followers just like you can on Twitter. Uh, you know, just buy real humans in China who will follow you. Mm. Um, so the problems as I see them with social media and from, you know, I don't use social media, but I see people who do. You use Reddit. And a big one, a big, I don't really use Reddit now. A, a big one is uh, addiction. I see people spending an enormous amount of time. You know, it's a real time vampire, generally speaking. People are genuinely addicted to these, uh, these things, you know, paging through other people's profiles and timelines and whatnot. The false news is a problem. I think, again, if if you're have a limited scope of news outlets, then you could be swayed by, you know, um, news that is perhaps not as in depth or even misleading, um, as distributed on these platforms. Um, false value. I think you can, uh, uh, an incorrect level of value can be, um, 
cultivated on these platforms. You know, the whole keeping up with the Joneses and, you know, assuming everybody is doing something that you're not, uh, even though that may not be the case. Um, you may think it's important to maintain your profile and that, you know, it's like uh, that popular Facebook game years ago, Farmville, <laughs> oh, yeah. where people would get up in the middle of the night just to work <laughs> on this game and spend lots of money with it uh, because they feel like, uh, you know, they have to keep up in this sort of herd mentality. Um, virtue signaling. I think that's a big one on these platforms. You know, people just basically not just want validation. They want you to know that they're a good person and that they're very moral and they'll get on these platforms to condemn other people because, you know, they're so morally superior. I see that as a problem as well. Um, and just the, the pressure to feel relevant, the pressure <laughs> to, to be alive and to make sure people, you know, know you're alive and you mm. just have to constantly publish otherwise you'll just disappear and be completely uh um, isolated which ironically people who use these platforms um too much probably are you know they're already isolated in their rooms uh and their only outlet is through these by these virtual means um the future what's going to happen um i don't know it sounds like you might have uh, more of an insight into that than I would. We should probably wrap up soon as well. I think the future is there will be more integration and collaboration between the different platforms. I think people will participate in several platforms, but there will be a sort of cumulative score for them, taking into consideration all of their interactions with the platforms. That's coming. I think AI and the chat bots will definitely come in. And I think companies will speak through their artificial intelligence on these platforms. So, for instance, you could follow the AI avatar of a company on the social network and it would be responsive and alive and posting and blogging by itself. Um, I think... People may follow machines unknowingly. So <laughs> there will be almost content creating AI bots who will attract followers because they're pushing the right buttons. I think that's happening. And I think Celebdac is coming back. I think that's definitely going to happen again. This is a, a BBC initiative many, many, many years ago where there was a NASDAQ, which is like a technology stock index, but for celebrities, and it just gave values to humans and how they're trending in terms of celebrity. So it would follow celebrities, and you could buy stocks in celebrities, and if there were a new movie or some event that involved them, then their stock value would go up or down. So I think that'll happen for everybody. It's sort of already here, but everybody will have a value uh, as if they're a share in that particular uh, platform. And blipverts, this is something from Max Headroom, where you had advertisements that are just like a second long, um, but a second is all you need to get your message across. So you could be on a social media platform and suddenly you just saw 50 advertisements <laughs> in a couple of seconds. Uh, I think blipvert, I think there are laws against doing it now in television. You're not allowed to show just one frame, um, but I think on social media get away with just flashing something at you so quickly you don't even remember seeing it but it's sort of embedded itself in your mind uh, subliminally so I think that's going to happen as well well if there's nothing else uh, you have been listening to Eclecticist uh, you can visit our webpage eclecticist.co.uk where you can find a feedback form at the bottom if you have any suggestions for topics and you can find information on all of our previous shows uh, we don't know what we're going to be speaking about next time, but we'll have a think and see if anybody gives us an idea. And you will be able to find information before we record on our website. And until then, good evening. Good evening.